The Longer Discourse on the Lion's Roar Translated by Bhikkhu Sujato So I have heard. At one time the Buddha was staying near Vasali, in a woodland grove behind the town. Now at that time, Sunakata, the Lichavi, had recently left this teaching and training. He was telling a crowd in Vasali, The ascetic Gotama has no superhuman distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. He teaches what he's worked out by logic, followed a line of inquiry, expressing his own perspective, and his teaching leads those who practice it to the complete ending of suffering the goal for which it's taught. Then Venerable Sariputta robed up in the morning and, taking his bowl and robe, entered Vasali for alms. He heard what Sunakhata was saying. Then he wandered for alms in Vasali. After the meal, on his return from alms round, he went to the Buddha, bowed, sat down to one side and told him what had happened. Sariputta, Sunakhata, that foolish man, is angry. His words are spoken out of anger. Thinking he criticises the realised one, in fact he just praises him. For it is praise of the realised one to say, his teaching leads those who practise it to the complete ending of suffering, the goal for which it's taught. But there's no way Sunakhata will infer about me from the teaching that blessed one is perfected, a fully awakened Buddha, accomplished in knowledge and conduct, holy, knower of the world, supreme guide for those who wish to train, teacher of gods and humans, awakened, blessed. And there's no way Sunakhata will infer about me from the teaching, that blessed one wields the many kinds of psychic power, multiplying himself and becoming one again, appearing and disappearing, going unimpeded through a wall, a rampart, or a mountain as if through space, diving in and out of the earth as if it were water, walking on water as if it were earth, flying cross-legged through the sky like a bird, touching and stroking with the hand the sun and moon, so mighty and powerful, controlling the body as far as the Brahma realm. And there's no way Sunakata will infer about me from the teaching, that blessed one with clear audience that is purified and superhuman, hears both kinds of sounds, human and divine, whether near or far. And there's no way Sunakata will infer about me from the teaching, that Blessed One understands the minds of other beings and individuals, having comprehended them with his own mind. He understands mind with greed as mind with greed, and mind without greed as mind without greed. He understands mind with hate, mind without hate, mind with delusion, mind without delusion, contracted mind, scattered mind, expansive mind, unexpansive mind, mind that is supreme, mind that is not supreme, mind immersed in samadhi, mind not immersed in samadhi, freed mind as freed mind, and unfreed mind as unfreed mind. The realised one possesses ten powers of a realised one, with these he claims the bull's place, roars his lion's roar in the assemblies, and turns the holy wheel. What ten? Firstly, the realised one truly understands the possible as possible, and the impossible as impossible. Since he truly understands this, this is a power of the realised one. Relying on this, he claims the bull's place, roars his lion's roar in the assemblies, and turns the holy wheel. 
Furthermore, the realised one truly understands the result of deeds undertaken in the past, future and present in terms of causes and reasons. Since he truly understands this, this is a power of the realised one. Furthermore, the realised one truly understands where all paths of practice lead. Since he truly understands this, this is a power of the realised one. Furthermore, the realised one truly understands the world with its many and diverse elements. Since he truly understands this, this is a power of the realised one. Furthermore, the realised one truly understands the diverse beliefs of sentient beings. Since he truly understands this, this is a power of the realised one. Furthermore, the realised one truly understands the faculties of other sentient beings and other individuals after comprehending them with his mind. Since he truly understands this, this is a power of the realised one. Furthermore, the realised one truly understands corruption, cleansing and emergence regarding the absorptions, liberations, immersions and attainments. Since he truly understands this, this is a power of the realised one. Furthermore, the realised one recollects many kinds of past lives, that is, one, two, three, four, five, ten, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, a hundred, a thousand, a hundred thousand rebirths, many eons of the world contracting, many eons of the world evolving, many eons of the world contracting and evolving. He remembers, there I was named this, my clan was that, I looked like this and that was my food. This was how I felt pleasure and pain, and that was how my life ended. When I passed away from that place, I was reborn somewhere else. There too, I was named this, my clan was that, I looked like this, and that was my food. This was how I felt pleasure and pain, and that was how my life ended. When I passed away from that place, I was reborn here. And so he recollects his many kinds of past lives with features and details. Since he truly understands this, this is a power of the realised one. Furthermore, with clairvoyance that is purified and superhuman, the realised one sees sentient beings passing away and being reborn, inferior and superior, beautiful and ugly, in a good place or a bad place. He understands how sentient beings are reborn according to their deeds. These dear beings did bad things by way of body, speech and mind. They spoke ill of the noble ones. They had wrong view. And they chose to act out of that wrong view. When their body breaks up after death, they're reborn in a place of loss, a bad place, the underworld, hell. These dear beings, however, did good things by way of body, speech and mind. They never spoke ill of the noble ones. They had right view, and they chose to act out of that right view. When their body breaks up after death, they're reborn in a good place, a heavenly realm. And so, with clairvoyance that is purified and superhuman, he sees sentient beings passing away and being reborn inferior and superior, beautiful and ugly, in a good place or a bad place. He understands how sentient beings are reborn according to their deeds. Since he truly understands this, this is a power of the realised one. Furthermore, the realised one has realised the undefiled freedom of heart and freedom by wisdom in this very life and lives having realised it with his own insight due to the ending of defilements. Since he truly understands this, this is a power of the realised one. Relying on this, he claims the bull's place, roars his lion's roar in the assemblies, and turns the holy wheel. A realised one possesses these ten powers of a realised one. With these he claims the bull's place, 
roars his lion's roar in the assemblies, and turns the holy wheel. When I know and see in this way, suppose someone were to say this, the ascetic Gotama has no superhuman distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. He teaches what he's worked out by logic, following a line of inquiry, expressing his own perspective. Unless they give up that speech and that thought, and let go of that view, they will be cast down to hell, just as a mendicant accomplished in ethics, immersion and wisdom would reach enlightenment in this very life. Such is the consequence, I say. Unless they give up that speech and thought, and let go of that view, they will be cast down to hell. Sariputta, a realised one, has four kinds of self-assurance. With these he claims the bull's place, roars his lion's roar in the assemblies, and turns the holy wheel. What for? I see no reason for anyone, whether ascetic, Brahmin, God, Mara or Brahma, or anyone else in the world, to legitimately scold me, saying, You claim to be fully awakened, but you don't understand these things. Since I see no reason, I live secure, fearless and assured. I see no reason for anyone whether ascetic, Brahmin, God, Mara or Brahma, or anyone else in the world, to legitimately scold me, saying, You claim to have ended all defilements, but these defilements have not ended. Since I see no reason, I live secure, fearless and assured. I see no reason for anyone, whether ascetic, Brahmin, God, Mara or Brahma, or anyone else in the world, to legitimately scold me, saying, The acts that you say are obstructions are not really obstructions for the one who performs them. Since I see no reason, I live secure, fearless, and assured. I see no reason for anyone, whether ascetic, Brahmin, God, Mara, or Brahma, or anyone else in the world, to legitimately scold me, saying, The teaching doesn't lead those who practice it to the complete ending of suffering, the goal for which you taught it. Since I see no such reason, I live secure, fearless and assured. A realised one has these four kinds of self-assurance. With these he claims the bull's place, roars his lion's roar in the assemblies, and turns the holy wheel. When I know and see in this way, suppose someone were to say this, the ascetic Gotama has no superhuman distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones, unless they give up that speech and that thought, and let go of that view, they will be cast down to hell. Sariputta, there are these eight assemblies. What eight? The assemblies of aristocrats, Brahmins, householders and ascetics, an assembly of the gods under the four great kings, an assembly of the gods under the thirty-three, an assembly of Maras, an assembly of Brahmas, these are the eight assemblies. Possessing these four kinds of self-assurance, the realised one approaches and enters right into these eight assemblies. I recall having approached an assembly of hundreds of aristocrats. There I used to sit with them, converse and engage in discussion. But I don't see any reason to feel afraid or insecure. Since I see no such reason, I live secure, fearless and assured. I recall having approached an assembly of hundreds of Brahmins, householders, ascetics, the gods under the four great kings, the gods under the thirty-three, Maras, Brahmas. There too I used to sit with them, converse and engage in discussion, but I don't see any reason to feel afraid or insecure. Since I see no such reason, I live secure, fearless and assured. 
When I know and see in this way, suppose someone were to say this, the ascetic Gotama has no superhuman distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones, unless they give up that speech and that thought and let go of that view, they will be cast down to hell. Sariputta, there are these four kinds of reproduction. What for? Reproduction for creatures born from an egg, from a womb, from moisture, or spontaneously. And what is reproduction from an egg? There are beings who are born by breaking out of an eggshell. This is called reproduction from an egg. And what is reproduction from a womb? There are beings who are born by breaking out of the amniotic sac. This is called reproduction from a womb. And what is reproduction from moisture? There are beings who are born in a rotten fish, in a rotten corpse, in rotten dough, in a cesspool or a sump. This is called reproduction from moisture. And what is spontaneous reproduction? Gods, hell beings, certain humans and certain beings in the lower realms. This is called spontaneous reproduction. These are the four kinds of reproduction. When I know and see in this way, suppose someone were to say this. The ascetic Gotama has no superhuman distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. Unless they give up that speech and that thought and let go of that view, they will be cast down to hell. There are these five destinations. What five? Hell, the animal realm, the ghost realm, humanity and the gods. I understand hell and the path and practice that leads to hell. And I understand how someone practicing that way, when their body breaks up after death, is reborn in a place of loss, a bad place, the underworld, hell. I understand the animal realm, the ghost realm, humanity, gods, and the path and practice that leads to the world of the gods. And I understand how someone practicing that way, when their body breaks up after death, is reborn in a good place, a heavenly realm. And I understand extinguishment and the path and practice that leads to extinguishment. And I understand how someone practicing that way realizes the undefiled freedom of heart and freedom by wisdom in this very life and lives having realized it with their own insight due to the ending of defilements. When I've comprehended the mind of a certain person, I understand this person is practicing in such a way and has entered such a path that when their body breaks up after death, they will be reborn in a place of loss, a bad place, the underworld, hell, then some time later I see that they have indeed been reborn in hell, where they experience exclusively painful feelings, sharp and severe. Suppose there was a pit of glowing coals deeper than a man's height, full of glowing coals that neither flamed nor smoked. Then along comes a person struggling in the oppressive heat, weary, thirsty and parched. But the path thereon heads in one direction only, to that very same pit of coals. If a person with good eyesight saw them, they'd say, this person is proceeding in such a way and has entered such a path that they will arrive at that very pit of coals. Then some time later, they see that they have indeed fallen into that pit of coals, where they experience exclusively painful feelings sharp and severe. When I've comprehended the mind of a certain person, I understand this person will be reborn in the animal realm. Then some time later I see that they have indeed been reborn in the animal realm, where they experience painful feelings, sharp and severe. Suppose there was a sewer deeper than a man's height, full to the brim with faeces. 
Then along comes a person struggling in the oppressive heat, weary, thirsty, and parched. But the path thereon heads in one direction only, to that very same sewer. If a person with good eyesight saw them, they'd say, This person is proceeding in such a way and has entered such a path that they will arrive at that very sewer. Then some time later, they see that they have indeed fallen into that sewer, where they experience painful feelings, sharp and severe. When I've comprehended the mind of a certain person, I understand, this person will be reborn in the ghost realm. Then some time later I see that they have indeed been reborn in the ghost realm, where they experience many painful feelings. Suppose there was a tree growing on rugged ground, with thin foliage casting dappled shade. Then along comes a person struggling in the oppressive heat, weary, thirsty, and parched. But the path thereon heads in one direction only, to that very same tree. If a person with good eyesight saw them, they'd say, This person is proceeding in such a way, and has entered such a path, that they will arrive at that very tree. Then some time later they see them sitting or lying under that tree, where they experience many painful feelings. When I've comprehended the mind of a certain person, I understand, this person will be reborn among human beings. Then some time later I see that they have indeed been reborn among human beings, where they experience many pleasant feelings. Suppose there was a tree growing on smooth ground, with abundant foliage casting dense shade. Then along comes a person struggling in the oppressive heat, weary, thirsty, and parched. But the path thereon heads in one direction only, to that very same tree. If a person with good eyesight saw them, they'd say, This person is proceeding in such a way, and has entered such a path, that they will arrive at that very tree. Then some time later they see them sitting or lying under that tree, where they experience many pleasant feelings. When I've comprehended the mind of a certain person, I understand, this person will be reborn in a good place, a heavenly realm. Then some time later I see that they have indeed been reborn in a heavenly realm, where they experience exclusively pleasant feelings. Suppose there was a stilt longhouse with a peaked roof, plastered inside and out, draught-free, with latches fastened and windows shuttered. And it had a couch spread with woollen covers, shag piled, pure white, or embroidered with flowers, and spread with fine deer hide, with a canopy above and red pillows at both ends. Then along comes a person struggling in the oppressive heat, weary, thirsty and parched. But the path thereon heads in one direction only, to that very same stilt longhouse. If a person with good eyesight saw them, they'd say, this person is proceeding in such a way, and has entered such a path, that they will arrive at that very stilt longhouse. Then some time later, they see them sitting or lying in that stilt longhouse where they experience exclusively pleasant feelings. When I've comprehended the mind of a certain person, I understand, this person is practicing in such a way, and has entered such a path, that they will realize the undefiled freedom of heart and freedom by wisdom in this very life, and live, having realized it with their own insight, due to the ending of defilements. Then some time later, I see that they have indeed realized the undefiled freedom of heart and freedom by wisdom in this very life and live having realized it with their own insight due to the ending of defilements, experiencing exclusively pleasant feelings. Suppose there was a lotus pond with clear, sweet, cool water, clean, with smooth banks, delightful, and nearby was a dark forest grove. Then along comes a person struggling in the oppressive heat, weary, thirsty, and parched. But the path thereon heads in one direction only, to that very same lotus pond. 
if a person with good eyesight saw them, they'd say, This person is proceeding in such a way, and has entered such a path that they will arrive at that very lotus pond. Then some time later, they would see that person after they had plunged into that lotus pond, bathed and drunk. When all their stress, weariness and heat exhaustion had faded away, they emerged and sat or lay down in that woodland thicket where they experienced exclusively pleasant feelings. In the same way, when I have comprehended the mind of a person, I understand this person is practising in such a way and has entered such a path that they will realise the undefiled freedom of heart and freedom by wisdom in this very life and live, having realised it, with their own insight due to the ending of defilements. Then some time later, I see that they have indeed realised the undefiled freedom of heart and freedom by wisdom in this very life and live, having realised it with their own insight due to the ending of defilements, experiencing exclusively pleasant feelings. These are the five destinations. When I know and see in this way, suppose someone were to say this, the ascetic Gotama has no superhuman distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. He teaches what he's worked out by logic, following a line of inquiry, expressing his own perspective. Unless they give up that speech and that thought, and let go of that view, they will be cast down to hell, just as a mendicant accomplished in ethics, immersion and wisdom would reach enlightenment in this very life. Such is the consequence, I say. Unless they give up that speech and thought, and let go of that view, they will be cast down to hell. Sariputta, I recall having practised a spiritual path consisting of four factors. I used to be a self-mortifier, the ultimate self-mortifier. I used to live rough, the ultimate rough liver. I used to be a shunner, the ultimate shunner. I used to be secluded, in ultimate seclusion. And this is what my self-mortification was like. I went naked, ignoring conventions. I licked my hands and didn't come or stop when asked. I didn't consent to food brought to me, or food prepared specially for me, or an invitation for a meal. I didn't receive anything from a pot, or bowl, or from someone who keeps sheep, or who has a weapon or a shovel in their home, or where a couple is eating, or where there is a woman who is pregnant, breastfeeding, or who has a man in her home, or where food for distribution is advertised or where there's a dog waiting, or flies buzzing. I accepted no fish, or meat, or liquor, or wine, and drank no beer. I went to just one house for alms, taking just one mouthful, or two houses and two mouthfuls, up to seven houses and seven mouthfuls. I fed on one saucer a day, two saucers a day, up to seven saucers a day. I ate once a day, once every second day, up to once a week, and so on, even up to once a fortnight. I lived committed to the practice of eating food at set intervals. I ate herbs, millet, wild rice, poor rice, water lettuce, rice bran, scum from boiling rice, sesame flour, grass or cow dung. I survived on forest roots and fruits, or eating fallen fruit. I wore robes of sun hemp, mixed hemp, corpse wrapping cloth, rags, lod tree bark, antelope hide whole or in strips, kusa grass, bark, wood chips, human hair, horsetail hair or owl's wings. I tore out hair and beard, committed to this practice. I constantly stood, refusing seats. I squatted, committed to the endeavour of squatting. 
I lay on a mat of thorns, making a mat of thorns my bed. I was committed to the practice of immersion in water three times a day, including the evening, and so I lived, committed to practicing these various ways of mortifying and tormenting the body. Such was my practice of self-mortification. And this is what my rough living was like. The dust and dirt built up on my body over many years until it started flaking off. It's like the trunk of a pale moon ebony tree, which builds up bark over many years until it starts flaking off. But it didn't occur to me, oh, this dust and dirt must be rubbed off by my hand or another's. That didn't occur to me. Such was my rough living. And this is what my practice of shunning was like. I'd step forward, or back, ever so mindfully. I was full of pity, even regarding a drop of water, thinking, may I not accidentally injure any little creatures that happen to be in the wrong place? Such was my practice of shunning. And this is what my seclusion was like. I would plunge deep into a wilderness region and stay there. When I saw a cowherd or a shepherd, or someone gathering grass or sticks, or a lumberjack, I'd flee from forest to forest, from thicket to thicket, from valley to valley, from uplands to uplands. Why is that? So that I wouldn't see them, nor they me. I fled like a wild deer seeing a human being. Such was my practice of seclusion. I would go on all fours into the cow pens after the cattle had left and eat the dung of the young suckling calves. As long as my own urine and excrement lasted, I would even eat that. Such was my eating of most unnatural things. I would plunge deep into an awe-inspiring forest grove and stay there. It was so awe-inspiring that normally it would make your hair stand on end if you weren't free of greed. And on cold nights like the eight days of winter, when the snow falls, I stayed in the open by night and in the forest by day. But in the last month of summer, I'd stay in the open by day and in the forest by night. And then these verses, which were neither supernaturally inspired nor learned before in the past, occurred to me. Scorched and frozen, alone in the awe-inspiring forest, naked, no fire to sit beside, the sage still pursues his quest. I would make my bed in a charnel ground, with the bones of the dead for a pillow. Then the cowboys would come up to me, they'd spit and piss on me, throw mud on me, even poke sticks in my ears. But I don't recall ever having a bad thought about them. Such was my abiding in equanimity. There are some ascetics and Brahmins who have this doctrine and view. Purity comes from food, they say. Let's live on jujubes. So they eat jujubes and jujube powder, and drink jujube truce, and they enjoy many jujube concoctions. I recall eating just a single jujube. You might think that at that time the jujubes must have been very big, but you should not see it like this. The jujubes then were at most the same size as today, Eating so very little, my body became extremely emaciated. Due to eating so little, my limbs became like the joints of an eighty-year-old or a corpse. My bottom became like a camel's hoof, my vertebrae stuck out like beads on a string, and my ribs were as gaunt as the broken-down rafters on an old barn. Due to eating so little, the gleam of my eyes sank deep in their sockets, like the gleam of water sunk deep down a well. Due to eating so little, my scalp shriveled and withered like a green bitter gourd in the wind and sun. Due to eating so little, 
the skin of my belly stuck to my backbone, so that when I tried to rub the skin of my belly, I grabbed my backbone. And when I tried to rub my backbone, I rubbed the skin of my belly. Due to eating so little, when I tried to urinate or defecate, I fell face down right there. Due to eating so little, when I tried to relieve my body by rubbing my limbs with my hands, the hair, rotted at its roots, fell out. There are some ascetics and Brahmins who have this doctrine and view. Purity comes from food, they say. Let's live on mung beans. Let's live on sesame. Let's live on ordinary rice. Due to eating so little, when I tried to relieve my body by rubbing my limbs with my hands, the hair, rotted at its roots, fell out. But Sariputta, I did not achieve any superhuman distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones by that conduct, that practice, that gruelling work. Why is that? Because I didn't achieve that noble wisdom that's noble and emancipating, and which leads someone who practices it to the complete ending of suffering. There are some ascetics and Brahmins who have this doctrine and view. Purity comes from transmigration. But it's not easy to find any realm that I haven't previously transmigrated to in all this long time, except for the gods of the pure abodes. For if I had transmigrated to the gods of the pure abodes, I would not have returned to this realm again. There are some ascetics and Brahmins who have this doctrine and view. Purity comes from rebirth. But it's not easy to find any rebirth that I haven't previously been reborn in. There are some ascetics and Brahmins who have this doctrine and view. Purity comes from abode of rebirth. But it's not easy to find an abode that I haven't previously abided in. There are some ascetics and Brahmins who have this doctrine in view. Purity comes from sacrifice. But it's not easy to find a sacrifice that I haven't previously offered in all this long time, when I was an anointed king or a well-to-do Brahmin. There are some ascetics and Brahmins who have this doctrine in view. Purity comes from serving the sacred flame. But it's not easy to find a fire that I haven't previously served in all this long time when I was an anointed king or a well-to-do Brahmin. There are some ascetics and Brahmins who have this doctrine and view. So long as this gentleman is youthful, young, black-haired, blessed with youth, in the prime of life he will be endowed with perfect proficiency in wisdom. But when he's old, elderly and senior, advanced in years, and has reached the final stage of life, eighty, ninety, or a hundred years old, he will lose his proficiency in wisdom. But you should not see it like this, for now I am old, elderly, and senior. I am advanced in years, and have reached the final stage of life. I am eighty years old. Suppose I had four disciples with a lifespan of a hundred years, and they each were perfect in memory, range, retention, and perfect proficiency in wisdom. Imagine how easily a well-trained expert archer with a strong bow would shoot a light arrow across the shadow of a palm tree. That's how extraordinary they were in memory, range, retention, and perfect proficiency in wisdom. They'd bring up questions about the four kinds of mindfulness meditation again and again, and I would answer each question. They'd remember the answers and not ask the same question twice, and they'd pause only to eat and drink, go to the toilet, and sleep to dispel weariness. But the realised one would not run out of Dhamma teachings, words and phrases of the teachings, or spontaneous answers. And at the end of a hundred years, my four disciples would pass away. Even if you have to carry me around on a stretcher, 
There will never be any deterioration in the realised one's proficiency in wisdom. And if there's any one of whom it may be rightly said that a being not liable to delusion has arisen in the world for the welfare and happiness of the people, for the benefit, welfare and happiness of gods and humans, it's of me that this should be said. Now at that time, Venerable Nagasamala was standing behind the Buddha, fanning him. Then he said to the Buddha, It's incredible, sir. It's amazing. While I was listening to this exposition of the teaching, my hair stood up. What is the name of this exposition of the teaching? Well, Nagasamala, you may remember this exposition of the teaching as the hair-raising discourse. This is what the Buddha said. Satisfied, Venerable Nagasamala was happy with what the Buddha said. <laughs>